Welcome back to the Forgecast. My name is Niels Ögren. I'm Sam Towns. And I'm Alex Norton. And I'm Dan Moss. Yes. And before we move on with the episode, let us take a moment to thank our sponsor. This episode of the Forgecast was brought to you by Gamerco Artisan Supplies, where Aussie blacksmiths and bladesmiths get the best equipment for blacksmithing and bladesmithing. From forge burner kits to tongs, you can follow them on Facebook and Instagram or visit their website, artisansupplies.com.au. So, Sam, you want to tell us about your week? Uh, yeah, actually, I've uh, f- had a pretty good week. Um, obviously, over the weekend, I was working away as a security officer um, at a festival, so didn't get much done because I was working night shifts, uh, 28 hours over two days. It was <laughs> it was mad. And uh, then I spent, like, two days recovering from having to go from day shifts to night shifts. Uh, and so I've only just been back in the forge since yesterday, which because we're recording on a Wednesday rather than a Thursday. Uh, it's had less time, but I did manage to get a couple of projects finished. I finished the uh, Turkish War Axe, the Turkish Turkish Saddle Axe. Mm-hmm. I uploaded a video, a YouTube video on that one. Um, that was a really fun build. Uh, it was actually, I got contacted a couple months ago by one of my fellow medieval reenactment um, players, and he, he plays like a Turkish person in uh, 16th century Turkey. You know, that's his character, you want to call it that. Um, so yeah, I finished that up, uh, put an edge on it, hardened it, all that kind of stuff. It came out really nice and it came out, I was really happy with the fact that it came out to the exact dimensions of the piece, the, uh, the image that a PC sent me because they actually wanted me to make one that was almost identical to one that there was in the museum somewhere. So, uh, yeah, that was a really good fun project. I also, um... Got some prep done for the next video I'm going to be doing, which is going to be using my charcoal forge. So I've been chopping charcoal yes. and <laughs> uh, okay. chopping chopping what little charcoal I have and thinking that I really, really need to get to my charcoal supplier so I can get a little bit more because I'm going to run out really fast. And I spent today, because I've been feeling really sick today, um, I decided to not fire up the forge and instead... Spent the day engraving, and I uh, en- was engraving on my hammer. I've almost finished engraving it, so I'll see awesome. you then. Ooh. Yeah, I'll be putting it putting it on the handle probably tomorrow, and um, yeah, it'll all be done. And you'll see photos of that on my Instagram and Facebook feeds uh, very soon, and then you'll probably see mm-hmm. me use it in future videos. Great. Um, but um, yeah, that's so. That's been me. What have you been up to, Alex? Well, you know, my story is all packing, but um, I've got actually got my birthday tomorrow, so I'm going to take a little bit of time off. Um, I've got a, a fun day planned, but this weekend I'm going to be lighting up the forge for the last time in Brisbane before I move, um, and that should be sad but fun. But uh, today I actually did, I've uh, got a new video out on the YouTube channel doing uh, jewellery making, which is how I got my start that led to blacksmithing. And yeah, I um, yeah, made a. I'm doing a collaboration with a local model from Brisbane, whose partner is a blacksmith, and um, that that's how I know her. And uh, she's going to model some of my jewelry in exchange for getting to keep the jewelry at the end of it. So I um, I was making that, and I thought I might do a video show on the process. So that cool. that came out quite nice, and and um, yeah, very pretty in the end, and she she should be happy with it. But uh, that's that's pretty much the extent of my week. It's pretty much same same old same old. Really, what about you, Nils? Yeah, I've been farming a lot this uh, week since my father is uh, on a trip to France. So I took over the responsibilities of the farm. So I've been feeding cows and stuff like that. And uh, also working on uh, finishing one of the bearded axes. Um, finished engraving that. Uh, fit it to the handle. I actually built a small uh, like uh, hydraulic, you know, those bottle jacks thing. I built like a... A pump system, a so I can. Yeah, I built like a press to fit the handle to the wood. No, the the head to the wood, uh, and it works really great. Um, very easy construction. I can post some pictures later on. It looks horrible though. So I finished the axe. I also forged the twin wolf head uh, thing for the pommel of the Witcher sword. Uh, 
Saw that. And, that uh, looked really good. Yeah, but I have some really, I have some questions about that. But we maybe can take that later in the episode or next week or something like that. Or after the show. Um, I did that. I also uh, smashed up my hammer. <laughs> Uh, yes, I saw that. Yeah. Sad, that sad. How did you hammer. forget to temper a hammer? I don't know. <laughs> I've never done a hammer before. Well, one. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just felt uh, like, all right, I, I heat treated it and I grind it and just fit it to the handle. And uh, I forgot to temper it. So it cracked <laughs> in the middle. So You're, Yeah, you got really lucky that it didn't like chip out the face and throw a chunk in your eye or something. Yeah, or in my body. Um, so uh, yeah <laughs> I was so lucky in my unlucky moments as we say in Swedish uh, and um, yeah so I'm figure, f- thinking of like uh, hanging that on the wall like a reminder uh, mm. uh, like temper or die like a slogan <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah I've been working enough. a lot on the sword and uh, stuff like that and farming has taken a lot of time so that's basically what I've been doing So, uh, what about you, Daniel? Okay, um, I'm currently working on an Art Nouveau set of panels to go inside a staircase. Uh, Customers had this staircase built and um, they went. I went and uh, saw them just before Christmas and they were like, oh, I want it to be fancy, but I want it to be simple. And then I did some drawings and they were like, fancier! And then I was like, did some more drawings and they were like, more of that! So, yeah, very complicated scrolls and and it's taking up more time than it should do. Um, Mm. But that's life. Um, And um, I work part-time for um, an art handling company. I'm a senior technician. Um, And if I'm not driving up and down the country moving expensive paintings, I'm... um, assisting with either restoration or how to install work. Um, and there's an exhibition at Cardiff, uh, National Museum, uh, National Museum Cardiff. Uh, it's this big central one next to the uh, universities. Um, and they've got a David Nash exhibition. Um, he's quite a large wood sculptor, did a lot of work out in California. And they had this large piece that they want to hang off a wall. So I made the bracket had it load tested, took it back to Cardiff, they painted it up, hung it on the wall, and uh, I shall put some pictures up on Instagram very soon, hopefully, of that. Uh, and the and the Wolfjaw Tongs as well, as a video this last week. So yeah, it awesome. came out fantastically. Thank yeah. you very much. Just I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but um I've I'm I'm looking forward to seeing it because I plan on making a few sets like that. So yeah. yeah. No, it's- Okay. They came out good. Enjoyed them, and uh, they're not really wolf jaws. I don't know actually what wolf jaws are because I see so many different variations. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they're more they're, they're more like, like a bolt, bolt combination jaw tongs. bolt tongs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mini bolt wolf yeah. jaws. I was going to call yeah, them re- really then, good yeah, style for ornamental work because you can actually uh, put bends and twists and, and ornamentation onto the end of a piece and then still hold it accurately because you've got that extra space behind the the gripping surface. It's really quite handy to have. Yeah, I thought if you flattened them off on one side, you could hold uh, railway spikes with them as well, maybe. Oh, yeah, work quite yeah. well. So, yeah, yeah that'll work. So, so they're quite versatile. I like, yeah, enjoyed doing those. So. Cool. So, um, I, I'm uh, thinking, like, I, if, we, if you go on to your YouTube channel, like, every video is, like, different, like, very different projects. It's everything from hammers to, like, almost yeah, or, ornamental works pizza cutter like it's it's hard to get a grip on uh, like for me it's mostly axes and swords that's mm. it not nothing else well i do some stuff for my my own uh, uh, use but but like w- what is it that you youth if you would describe yourself as a blacksmith what is it that you do i, I uh, just a blacksmith I, yeah. traditionally in the uk at least or, or europe um Smiths were the guy on the corner on the fork of a road who would mm. you'd rock up and go, hey, my pan's broken. Can you fix me pan? And then you'd fix your pan. Or um, could you shoe my horse? Or and I think one of the one of the things that's happened recently is the diversity within fringes. So you've got your central core; it's all blacksmithing. But as you divide it down, you've got bladesmiths, and then in the bladesmithing community you've got your pure forgers who who hate using a grinder and then you've got your guys who just take a blank and just grind that up and you know Mm. so what i consider that i do is i make everything and anything as a traditional 
uh, blacksmith. So um, I don't shoe horses because I don't have a qualification to, but it's not something that I would say I wouldn't like to try. Um, I definitely like to make horseshoes. Um, putting them on horses, I'm not so keen on horses myself, but... <laughs> <laughs> Nor am I. Especially grabbing one by the back end and holding onto it for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, I, I don't know. Anyway, it, yeah, it's just that's... that's that's what we've always been shown as an example in the U or, or my, my education has always been, you can make a pizza cutter or you can make, um, a large stainless steel Eagle sculpture. So yeah, that's- no, it, it may be, yeah, I may be very biased in this opinion, but I've always thought of blacksmiths as the king of craftsmen because they're the only one that can really make tools. Yeah. It, um, the worshipful company of blacksmiths in the UK, it, their motto is, um, I've forgotten it. That's really good, isn't it? Yeah. It's something to do with mar- <laughs> it's, it's something to do with a hammer in hand, the master of all crafts, or something like that. Um, because of the fact that they were the traditional tool makers who would enable carpenters to chop down trees and make houses, and mm. uh, you know, to- and it's, it's that making of tools that actually is, makes it exciting for you to be on here. Because if anybody uh, listening who doesn't follow Daniel Moss's channel, and you absolutely should, if uh, if you don't already. This is a man who has been making his own leg vice, which is something I've never never heard of anybody else trying, and it's coming out absolutely brilliantly. And now he's working on his own quite large anvil. He's done the practice one; it came out brilliantly. Um, and it's it's sort of there's making tools that are tongs and hammers. You know, they're the sort of thing that are quite manageable in a small shop. But then making your own post vice is just that's an incredible undertaking. I mean, yeah. Oh, it's just I can't even fathom the process to be honest. In my little uh, smithy, I'm not sure if any of the others listening can I, actually fathom it. I, I've so, just I've just started working on a six kilogram lump of steel, which is the biggest lump of steel I've ever worked with, and I'm I'm starting to regret it already. So I, I can't even imagine what Dan's doing. Uh, it, is, it was always an apprentice task. It was always the task, the last task you completed if you did a sort of a structured apprenticeship in uh, well, at le- 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 least in sort of the last 300 years sort of if you did a traditional apprenticeship where you had a structure where you weren't the boy that ended up working in the forge on the fork in the road you were you were in an industrial smithy making steam engines your final piece was a leg vice so um and it was done by hand <laughs> and i've got a power hammer and an elliot so <laughs> um uh that makes it easier for me but um yeah but uh, and and again it comes back down to this uh, anvils were traditionally made by blacksmiths. Not that I'm going to make it traditionally. I'm going to use arc welding processes. But um, I don't blame you. <laughs> I, I just I don't have the skill set. I don't have the ability to do it. So I'm not going to even attempt it yet. Um, not, only, not only that, but the size of the forge you would need to forge weld those you know, that that large piece of material. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I've seen videos online of, of guys yeah. doing the the you know quad sledge. Group and you got a couple of guys with bars lifting the anvil out of the out of the fire to get it welded. You need, you need an a entire team. team of people. You need an entire team of people just to make it work. So yeah, I don't. So, don't so we're making that by hand. Them. We're going to make yeah. the whole thing by hand. So uh, I've got. Um, I think it's four students, kilos, wasn't it going to be? Whoa! Yeah, the total weight's eighty kilos. Yeah, so one hundred and sixty yeah. pounds ish. One hundred sixty six oh. pounds. Yeah. Well, that's, so, that's twice the weight of my biggest anvil at the moment. So, <laughs> uh, so, so um, I always, when we have guests on, this is a tradition now because I've done it three times, I think. So this is my fourth <laughs> time. I'm going, I already know this answer because I, I, I have a keen eye. I always look for this in people's videos. But I wanted the, the listeners to know because I want to know anyways. What kind of anvil do you have, Daniel? I'm going to butcher the the Swedish pronunciation, aren't I? Now, um, yeah. it's it's a kolschwa. Is that? It's not that the, bad. It's not that bad. Oh, it's a Swedish made. Um, I believe it's cast steel with a, a welded face. Um, kolschwa um, anvil that I found in Belgium of all places. Um, Whoa! So I dragged that back with me. So yeah, that's cool. All right. How big is it? Um, I. Th- I'm pretty sure it's 100 kilos, that one. So it's not very big, but it's it's big enough. So. It's pretty big. Uh, not, <laughs> not, not very yeah. big, yeah. It's, 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 it's a little bit small sometimes, but... Um. <laughs> yeah, it's big, I mean, bigger than both my anvils combined. 
<laughs> Sorry. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm laughing. My, 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 as I said, my biggest anvil's 40 kilos. I got a 50 kilo, uh, cast iron Chinese anvil, but uh, I broke the heel off it. So now it's about a 40 kilo Chinese anvil. <laughs> I suppose yeah. if, I, if, if I called my steak anvil, the, including the stand things, it's all welded together. If I called that an anvil, it probably weighs about 65, 70 kilos. So that'd probably mm-hmm. be my heaviest, but yeah, I don't count the stand. So. <laughs> So yeah, Swedish anvils are uh, pretty good in my opinion, and Kolsva is uh, very good uh, anvils. They're they're I think they're like um, the top branch in Sweden at the moment because I don't think that Sir the Fors is making their anvils anymore. Okay, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. If I'm wrong, you can write that to us uh, later on. But uh, that's what I think, and it's uh, it's always nice to see. Uh, <laughs> like uh, I know that the Man at Arms guys, they they also ha- they have a lot of different anvils, but they have a, a, a Kolsva anvil that's spelled Sweden wrong on it. <laughs> so it's <laughs> Sevden. It says, <laughs> and it's hilarious. So, thank you for the information, Dan. No, it's a pleasure, um, and it's a great, uh, it's a beautiful piece of. Uh... I was forging on a uh, a cast anvil when I first started because it's all I could find at the time. And like I was a student, and it's the only money I had, and it was like seventy English pounds. Was seventy, uh, uh, and I don't know what's that. That's about what's ninety dollars, ninety five dollars, something like that. Yeah. Yep. Something and, like that. And. Uh, it, it, it was hideous. Uh, it, was, it, was the, it was the worst thing. And being at college and then going and using this bloody thing in my tiny little, uh, like, 50, 60 kilo cast thing. Oh, I was driving me nuts. It was doing my you gotta, you, you, Everyone's got to start somewhere, I suppose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a, there's a strange phenomenon that anvils tend to find the blacksmith and not the other way around. <laughs> yeah, you'll, yeah you'll I think be, that's quite true. You'll be somewhere looking for something else entirely and all of a sudden there's just this person using a 120 kilo um, anvil as a pot rest somewhere in their garden and you say oh are you you using that mm, mm, <laughs> give a 50 yeah. bucks for it yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my problem with that is that every time every time i come across one of those they don't want to get rid of it it looks yeah. too nice in my garden and i just uh, yeah it makes me want to nice in my right. forge yeah, I can give you, I, I can give you a here. tip for that just uh, exchange a sword and you will get it that's how i got my yeah no idea. And I've tried that. I've tried that. <laughs> so so that we've got um, Daniel Moss on because he is one of the few YouTubers who actually works on larger, more ornate projects uh, uh, and shows the process. Um, one of the my, ones that come to mind that was my favorite to watch him work on was a giant banister um, and stair railing for a, um, it was a fairly small staircase, but still an ornate piece. Um, and he's done some large sculpture work. Um, earlier visitors to his website would have seen the eagle sculpture that he'd done. Um, he's got a great, I think it's a hanging chair by uh, the one that's by the the, the lake. Mm. Is it, it looks like it's a not. Chair. It's not a chair. Oh, it's like BA art degree conceptual mind thing. <laughs> <laughs> that one. Just, uh, it um, looks like a hell of a lot of work, is what it looks like. Yeah, I uh, I got a bit of a reputation at uni for finding the biggest piece of stock and trying to get it under the <laughs> smallest hammers. <laughs> um, and I and I owe that to uh, a very interesting Swedish gentleman called uh, Roger Lund, um, who I worked with for a bit, um, the incredible Swedish madman. Um, do you know, Nils, do you know Roger Lund? No, not uh, on the top of my head, but I could uh, look that up. He's probably He's, uh, in my I've... group on the, on the Facebook. I'll look it up. Right, Poss- I have possibly. heard of him. I I saw him uh, do a demonstration with a banner, you know, over in America. Oh, okay. And I think they took him over there for one of their hammer ins, and um, yeah. yeah, he did a demonstration. So I, I saw that. That was yeah. awesome. Uh, this sort of um, this sort of mindset of this individual is it it has one heat. And I get the whole job done in one go. And he's working like 50, 60 kilo pieces of steel at a time under hammers that have ram weights of in excess of 800 kilos. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Like it's it's an unparalleled uh, power to how, you know, sort of be able to put something underneath it and just watch it go... And just it's it's flat. (laughs) It's just, it's nothing like it in the world. It's so exhilarating. 
We here at the Forgecast all have power hammer envy, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't even have people helping us strike most of the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a striker once a week. I beat you guys. <laughs> so, so if that uh, Roger Lund is the same guy you're talking about, I believe he is. Mm. Uh, he's living very close to me, actually. He's not far from Karlstad. Yeah, uh, I live yeah. very close to Karlstad. Okay, cool. Well, that's where me, me and my um, partner, we, we, we travelled up. Uh, we travelled to Gothenburg. We mooched around Gothenburg. I went to go and see um, the university at, I'm going to get this wrong as well, Stenaby? Is it, Stenaby. Is it pronounced? Stenaby. Sorry. Stenaby. That's it. It's not pronounced Stenaby. Um, we went there. We looked around. I was going to do my MA uh, there and then decided against it because I didn't think I was good enough. Um, and then... Uh, we went and hang out with Roger for a bit, and that was good fun. It was really good fun. It was so much snow. It was about minus 14 as well at the time. It was great. It was brilliant. It was like a dream. I couldn't have asked for anything to exhilarate me and sort of push my practice forward uh, any better. And it sort of got this bug then, the bigger and hotter and, like, the the more you, know, you could get a power hammer involved and do crazy stuff with it. And, yeah, it just... I don't know, sort of took off and uh, I'm obsessed. So, so what kind of uh, challenges and, and uh, interesting tidbits have you run into by doing working on larger pieces that uh, your <laughs> average blacksmith may not have encountered? Um, oh, uh, I, I mean, the, 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 just the, the issues that come with forging bigger, just I don't have a fire big enough to do half the jobs I try to do, and I end up having to try and work out how to get things hot. Um, like an oxy torch or something. Uh, yeah, I, the coal the coal fire does a good job for a majority, but it's when you need a long a long heat on something, and um, it's yeah, it's it's one of the problems with using the coal forge. To be fair, I need to get some sort of liquid fuel fire, uh, a diesel or a kerosene forge would be uh, uh or an engine an old engine oil forge uh, would be a much better because it burns so much hotter and they give yeah, I've, I've got a friend who recently built a, a uh, an oil powered forge and he's getting some ridiculous results out of it mm, mm, burns really clean um and um it, it, it burns up more of the oxygen so you get less descale as well so um they're yeah, I, so that's one of the issues. One of the issues is I'm always overzealous with what I think I can do, and I put 50 mil square or two inch square bar in a fire and go, oh, I'm going to be here a while. <laughs> 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 so that's uh, that's that's always one of the issues, and um, uh, sometimes it's not actually being able to experiment with something because you don't know how the material is going to react. Um, because you, you go, oh, I'll try it an inch, and you do it under the power hammer, and you go, well, that kind of worked. And then you you then kind of forget that that's four times the volume when it's mm. 50 square. It's not twice as big. It's four times as big, and then you yeah. and it doesn't work. And it's like, oh, good. Yeah. And then that's, you know, and then the cost as well. Like, I don't know. I, I say this a lot to people. Oh, it's just inch bar. And then they go, yeah, but inch bar is like 35, 40 quid. Uh, 40 pounds um and then you go oh god it's two inch bar it's like 300 quid for a length and it's, 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 it's yeah. little magnitudes uh uh yeah it's, i've just forked out i've just forked out 280 quid on this stock for this anvil just just the body of the anvil is yeah. is, is like 280 quid so and it's then funny, the plate that's going on top it's funny the uh exponential cost of, of steel as you get you know larger Mm. Um, I mean, I imagine even just per kilo. getting a power hammer in your forge, you start eyeing off bigger billets and things, and then you start <laughs> getting the taste for it. Um, if you do everything with hand hammers, you never really want to go bigger than about inch round. Mm. Yeah, yeah, um, totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, look at you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, man. <laughs> I, I think weight is an important thing to think about. Um, like, yeah, you say I don't want to work inch round, but uh, you'll work a two pound, two and a half pound blank, which is like forty square. So you're talking like inch and a inch and a quarter. So, but that I mean that's a volume thing, isn't it? You've you've got a smaller billet it's easier to manipulate when it's on the end of a bar this is the other thing is you want something on the end of a bar and the bar's like two meters long 
you've got to pull that thing in and out and fire and by the end of the day you suck it's like you, yeah. you've got the fatigue from just whipping it in and out and in and out and having to hold it and then forge with one hand um and i often tell people that i've never been as fit as i am since being a blacksmith nothing has given me the level of fitness that i've had you're not this. you're not swinging your armor hard enough your arm should be raw. raw. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, I've back problems and things. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've recently been making. I, I mean, I, I said I made an axe at the beginning of the of the week, but um, yeah, I, I've been getting into making a lot more hammers and stuff like that recently. So I've been starting to work larger and larger stock. I think the largest stock that I've worked so far was fifty mil round. Uh, and I I do have the advantage of having a striker that strikes for me. Unfortunately, we only have a seven seven pound sledge to work with. But uh, yeah, it's it's certainly a, an entirely different magnitude of work <laughs> that goes into making that kind of stuff. Um, I would greatly value a power hammer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially one with yeah. Go- especially one with googly eyes. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to put I need to redo the eyes. So keep coming off. Keep using that <laughs> side of the hammer and melting them off. It's quite horrific. Mm. <laughs> but, I, but, but I mean, for for someone like us, uh, well, not us, but like me, that that uh, currently does not have a power hammer. I'm planning to build one. But like, how did you come across your first power hammer or your power hammer? Um, He's English. <laughs> so, I, you're in Australia. There's loads of them. They're just laying around. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, big it's ones. Finding them a hard part. <laughs> um, uh, I I finished my degree and it was quite clear I needed a power hammer um, because I wasn't going to be able to complete any of the tasks I'd set myself during my degree in my own workshop. So um, I approached a friend and I said, look, I want to set this business up and this is what I want to do. This is my business model. Can you help? And I was expecting him to say, I'll give you a, a grand or something. And he said, I'll lend you the entire amount that you need to buy the hammer. I was like, wow. By the time I didn't quite have the hammer. Um, and um, I, the college where, or the uni where I did my degree, the actual blacksmithing part of it, they had an old Massey, an old two weight, mine's a three, but they had an old two weight. And I didn't know if it worked. And I can't remember if the anvil had cracked. I think the anvil had snapped, the casting for the anvil had snapped. And I'd gone and I'd sort of said, look, I'm desperate. How can I have the hammer? And they said, uh, this, this is my first contact with Alex Steele. Um, I, I, uh, I, um, I said, I said, how can I have the hammer? And they said, well, you can't give us cash. We're a, we're a college. You can't buy anything off us. We can't sell anything, but you can swap it. You can buy another power hammer and swap it. And what we would like is, um, a, uh, sort of somewhere in the region of 60 to 75 kilo hammer because we can't put a two-piece hammer in and we don't really want students sticking 100 mil square bar under power hammers because we just can't that isn't safe to do in this environment so if you can find one you can have it i was like cool excellent so i got in contact um with vaughn's which is a british um tool supplier blacksmith tool supplier and um they, uh, they, I think they were going for a recession. Uh, not that we were, we were in the recession, but I think they were, um, I think they were going through liquidation at the time or something. Something was happening right. and they were selling recons hammers, but they couldn't get new ones for some reason. And Alex Steele had just bought a recon Sahindler from them. And, um, I messaged him. I said, what do you think of the recon? And he was having some problems with it. And he listed off all these issues. There were some timing issues and, and I was panicking. I was like, oh, I'm going to buy one of these. I'm going to give it to the college. It's not going to work. It's going to cause all these problems. And um, a friend of mine, uh, Josh Delisle, I've done a few videos with Josh. And if you don't know his channel, definitely recommend checking him out. He's incredible blacksmith. Um, and he said, Dan, I've got this power hammer. I can't get it out of my driveway because every time we try to get it up there, it sinks in the trailer and gets stuck. We have to get it recovered and we can't get it up there it's five grand if you can get the money you can have it i was like i've got five grand <laughs> i love it <laughs> so i so i bought it off him and then um got it delivered to the workshop and then it proceeded to sit outside for three months and rot whilst they saved up the money um to buy seven tons of concrete mm. to dig a hole that was four meters by two and a half meters by 
three meters to fill with seven tons of concrete and a frame and then have these bolts made and by the time it all added up oh and then i didn't have three phase so my we had to buy this in special inverter anyway so by the time it all added up it was like 12 and a half grand to put a power hammer in so yeah people people seem to have these really unrealistic expectations of what buying big machinery like that it would cost I've had a few people go, oh, you know, you can buy a power hammer. They're like, you know, five grand or whatever, you know, like there's been a couple of uh, reconned ones for sale on the, the local pages. And I'm like, yeah, first I need a place to put it. Then I need the <laughs> mountings and all that kind of crap. And then I need to make sure that it runs. And if it doesn't, then I have to get it, you know, and you just, you think about it and it's like, yeah, okay. I don't have 20 grand lying around. To, yeah. <laughs> to do yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This yeah. is why my plan is to build a treadle hammer. Nice and safe yeah. and easy and cheap. <laughs> yeah not quite yeah. as effective <laughs> yeah I know, but I mean if it gives you the ability to do work that you couldn't do before I mean more power to you and um, I think that's one of the nice things about Roy's channel and his, his wacky power hammers um, hopefully going to see him <laughs> in September um, that'd be cool and yeah it's that'd just going to be really cool so um, yeah if you I, I would I would recommend anyone undertaking the task um, I just be prepared to have no money and, <laughs> and, and a questionable relationship with something that is an animal. So <laughs> is that, is that why you put the googly eyes on it? Just to have a bit of feeling? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 um, there was a, this Bridgeport mill was come up for sale in this, um, model club and I, they said that you had to put to, in order to be able to access the buyers list, you had to make comments and um, on certain posts in order to, and I made this really bizarre comment about, uh, it's just, uh, something about, um, I, uh, yeah, the love of machinery. It's like my, my girlfriend thinks I've got another woman and um, they instantly blocked me <laughs> from the listing. So I couldn't Wait. even look at them. I was like, oh, damn it. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a passion. It's, uh, yeah, it's just, yeah. A thrill to be able to have it and use it and it's one of the reasons i get the students to come up because they do have access to power hammers but nothing like that and the excitement that i had working with roger and then um allowing the students to have that same and I, you know elliot comes up and dan's been up before and it was the ream of students that continue to come i've got another guy coming on friday he's going to have his first try and just to see their play, the the the, you know, the joy on their face to just whack something and something happen because <laughs> those college hammers are quite asthmatic and <laughs> yeah. They, yeah, they're a bit like <sighs> okay, <sighs> whereas this one just sort of goes squish and you go oh I ruined my work but it was amazing <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really exciting. It's um it's good it's you know it's nice that you feed it at Christmas as well. <laughs> yeah um i didn't want to do that again um but um i got i got some really moody comments about that about me wasting food and stuff i was like seriously it's christmas pudding no one really eats it <laughs> i do <laughs> i'm surprised that it actually um did squish some of the british english pudding uh, the christmas pudding i've had before oh thanks <laughs> they weren't Probably cooked they were still raw technically so they were nice and nice and gooey so oh, um good. We're still finding bits of the second one. <laughs> another another tool that I'm quite jealous uh, that you have is your uh, fly press. Your fly press oh, is yeah, freaking incredible. I've been using it a lot lately in your videos. I use that daily. Like that is, um, again, one of the things with the videos is people moan about, I haven't got a fly press. Show me how to do it by hand. And it's like, well, it's not how I would normally do it. But yeah, so the, that, that fly press, again, that was a purchase that I made um, an engineering company wanted some work done and it was like these brackets I think I showed that in the video and I've consistently been making those brackets since I started at the workshop um, must have made about 3,000 of them now and um, it's yeah it's great to have it and it was like 350 quid it was next to nothing Jeez. and it earned its money back in no time um, yeah, and no. then just before Alex Steele started taking off I had a student in the college uh, from America. He was like, I'm going to buy a load of fly presses and take them out to the States. Um, and he, I unwittingly told him where I was buying my fly presses from. And I panicked and I emptied my savings and I rushed down. I went, what can I buy for 500 pounds? And I came back with 10 fly presses. Um, what? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I panicked. But I, 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 like, so now I won't tell anyone where I buy my forklift truck tines from. I won't even take students down there just in case they go, because <laughs> they'll just buy all of my stock. And um, I'll protect your sources. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, fly press is amazing. Love that. Yeah. And again, go get as big as you can get with that because you won't regret it. They have the same rule with power hammers. And Roger said this to me. Roger said, if you can afford to buy the biggest hammer, buy that hammer because you can do small work with big hammers, especially air hammers. Mechanical hammers, not so much. Mechanical hammers sort of have the restriction that they are set to work within, you know, a certain Certain range. And then if you need to work bigger stock, you have to move them and stuff. I think if you look at, to to be on Armin's, um, his mechanical hammer he has, he can move the dies apart. And that's quite clunky and quite cumbersome and, uh, you get different power ratios depending on how high the hammer sits and certain things. Um, and um, pneumatic hammers have this ability to strike from quite high up to quite low down. And yeah, the, uh, the, the closer you get to the, the, the top part of the, um, the cylinder, the, um, uh, the, the power does degree, decrease, but you st- you're still getting effective blows. So, and mm-hmm. you can come down and you can do little tippy tappy forging. You can forge three mil round under that thing, or you can, you can put 150 mil round under there if you wanted to. So yeah, I've seen some yeah. great videos where people will put a, uh, a match box that's been slid mm-hmm. open underneath the power hammer and then okay. use the power hammer to just with little tippy taps, gradually slide the match box closed again. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. and then they smash it. Yeah, there's a guy, um, I'm trying to remember his name now. He um, he gets his Rolex in the box, sticks a stamp upside down, licks a stamp, sticks it upside down, glass face first, and brings the pallet of the top die down onto the onto the watch, touches it, lifts it up, and puts the camera underneath, and the stamp stuck on the top pallet. And the, and the watch and the watch is fine. It's Whoa. like I ain't doing that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of trust in your in your machinery right there. Mm. And these oh. you, these these um, uh, Belgian built Bechets and the big American Nazelles and the uh, the Masseys, they've got that pedigree. They can do that. And uh, yeah. I mean, Australia is overridden with Masseys. They're everywhere. Um, you've just got to find really? them. <laughs> Point the money out to me. <laughs> yeah, there's some up on eBay at the minute. There's a couple up on eBay. Oh, it's, it's funny, um, I because being in in Western Australia, um, I'm in the the butthole of Australia, uh, where there is nothing. <laughs> Uh, there, as as far as I know, and I run the West Australian uh, Facebook page for blacksmiths. Um, there are only three running um, power hammers in Western Australia. Um, <laughs> okay, fair enough. I know, I know of two more. Um, but they don't run, <laughs> and the and the owners don't want to get rid of them. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's it's ridiculous over here in in WA finding hammers. Uh, obviously, Anyang's moved in, so mm-hmm. you know Anyang hammers are kind of everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, it's impossible to find hammers over here. Like I, you, I spend days looking. I don't spend days looking anymore because I don't have any bloody money. So. <laughs> I, I think the thing you don't have is. Um the smaller hammers over in Australia. Yeah. There's no culture of making shear blades. It's all it's all get the stuff out of the ground, turn it into raw material and forge it into bar or train track or turn it into parts to make machines so that we can make more steel or whatever. So like, you don't have so much of a small blade community. Whereas I think in the US, they've got lots of mechanical hammers because they have that blade, for like making, like little giants are designed for drawing out uh, plow times and sides and stuff like that that was their sort of their purpose in life and they've got tons of them out there for some reason so yeah yeah it's the same in sweden but uh, since we're such a small country we don't have that many hammers compared to like the us or great britain i think so Mm. Mm. i've said it before but here in brisbane where i live you you can't even look at a photo of a power hammer for less than a grand (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I should start charging you, Alex. It's, it's, it's like um, evilly, evilly per, works, per which I'm, I'm, sh- I'm sure Dan, you've heard of evilly works. I mean, Alec visited there. Um, yeah. when he came over to Australia. Uh, they're the probably it's probably the largest collection of power hammers in in Australia. It's over in Sydney, and they've got uh, like a forty ton power hammer. It's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> the thing, the, the thing the is, is like three stories high. 
Is that uh, right? I don't think of it. Um, I think they've got the smaller one, the the twenty ton one running. Mm-hmm. Um, the I think uh, Matt was showing me a video at um at Sydney Knife Show last year of of them running a uh, I think it was a fifty kilogram billet between two guys under this hammer, and it was just you know <laughs> and, you know turn this fifty gram block square block into a flat plate in nice. you know, a couple of hits. Nice. Uh huh. Yeah, I think I think at that point you're you're getting too large. You're like, you know, you want to buy the largest hammer, but I think at that point when you need an entire building just to house the, the power <laughs> hammer, I think I think you're yeah, getting when, a little too big. When the <laughs> lights dim in two adjacent suburbs while you're using it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I mean, for for most of it, like for not for much for Nils because he lives on a farm, but uh, for Alex until he moves to Tasmania, and for me. I live in suburb uh, the suburbs, and mm. having anything like a power hammer in in the suburbs would just yeah. I, I think it's I'd why be arrested I'm, for noise. It's complaints. why I'm <laughs> opting for the treadle hammer because where I'm moving to is actually off grid. So um, running a power hammer or any sort of three phase power off of a mm. solar battery setup is going to be not happening. So treadle hammer is where yeah. it's going to be for me. Check out um, you, Paul McCoola design. Oh, sorry, what were we saying? Paul McCoola is a South African blacksmith who's completely off grid, and he's running two, three weights off solar. Right. Wow. So yeah, he's a really interesting guy. Paul McCoola, his name is. He's really he came over to the UK not so long ago to teach him lectures and stuff. So uh, is, is he running anything else on the solar? <laughs> uh, yeah, he lives off grid, completely off grid, Can, um, and he runs um, coke and charcoal mixed fuel. Um, he sort of has ratios for that and sort of uh, makes his own charcoal. Really, really interesting guy. Really worth checking out. Um, Great. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to be moving to making a lot of my own charcoal um, just because it's, it's easier. I mean, you you cannot find blacksmith's coke in Australia. It's very, very difficult. I mean, there are places that will sell it, but it will bankrupt you if you were to go with it. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's pretty much a- uh, anthracite if you can get it or um, charcoal, which mm. is fine by me. I mean, charcoal, you can make it in your backyard. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's it's easy enough to do um, and mm. to be honest you get the right species and you can have barely any ash if you use there's a wood uh, uh, called jarrah which you can get a lot around here um, which it gives you amazing heat and hardly any ash whatsoever if you make charcoal out of it but most charcoals that you can buy here are all mangrove which gets very ashy right okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's surprising that massive coal producing countries don't sell coke like, mm. um, because it's getting harder to get it here, um, and the quality's yeah, well, I mean, dropping off here, as well. Here in Australia, yeah, the, the big problem, like we've got the Collie Coal Mine, um, like a hundred kilometers south of me, um, but the coal that is produced there has such a high sulfur content that it's just not good for blacksmithing. Oh, okay. Um, it's it, yeah, I I actually got given a bag of it for um, uh, for Christmas, like the first year that I started blacksmithing, and. All of my steel started crumbling in the forge. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> went, Sam was wrong very with bad this. that year. He got a whole bag of coal for Christmas. Well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Santa got wise to me after that year, though. Um, I'll tell you what. The, the, the big benefit of the uh, having that much sulfur is you can fart as much as you want while you're forging. <laughs> Every cloud it covers the smell. Yeah. <laughs> My neighbors didn't like it. <laughs> so I, ha- I have a question uh, for you, Dan. Um, like we discussed in the beginning of the episode, like uh, how I'm more of an axe smith, Sam's more of a bladesmith, uh, Alec is, is more like everything. I don't know what to call you anymore. You used to be a jeweler, but I'm, now, now I'm you're just, just I'm making... Just a black, I'm just, just a blacksmith. Just like Dan. <laughs> yeah, okay. Like, um, like you're in the traditional... Um, uh, part of a, I don't know how to say it, but anyways, is there anything that you would like to try that you haven't tried yet? Sorry for the long introduction to the question. No, no uh, yeah, there's there's loads I want to do. Um, and what what would I really like to make? Um, I think the anvil is a big thing that I'd like to do. Um, mm-hmm. and I have I have a plan. I, I, there's a guy um, on YouTube making these, or was um, I don't even does videos anymore. He's making the like the actual chassis of the car, the steel frame chassis of the car. And this wow. car is huge. And there's two boys and their treadle hammer and this tiny little little giant thing. And I just think that the, the idea of being able to build a car or a plow was the other idea I thought I might like to make for one of the bigger projects for like 
32,000 subs or um, 100 and uh, what is it next? 164, something like that. A plow would fit quite nicely in that weight category. And it'd be quite easy to make because you could draw it out in sections. And I say that it wouldn't be easy to make at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah that's, actually, um, yeah. So I mean, that's that's cool. I'm sorry, I just uh, wanted to because we're coming up on the hour, and I kind of want to get your uh, your feelings on this. Being that one, you're one of the the bigger blacksmithing YouTubers. Um, you know that you know it's Roy Adams and um, you know, John Switzer from Black Bear and Torbjorn, and obviously we've mentioned Alex Steele, who is the the biggest blacksmithing YouTuber on on the platform. Uh, and also we had Man at Arms until they shut down, and now we've got mm. That Works, um, with Ilya and Matt. Um, mm. But yeah, with with this uh, with our kind of uh, craft, our passion getting more popularized, um, are you seeing uh, much more interest in your work? And have you do you think it's all a positive thing or all a negative thing, or you know what's what's your take on it? Um, it it's yeah, it's a really good question. Um, the context in which people approach me about things is like, um, do you make knives? Um, mm. And a lot of the sales that I'm seeing based on this sort of trend that's happening in, in, in business is, uh, is based around the idea of making tooling for people. So the, the YouTube sort of boom that we're getting because of Forge and Fire and obviously Alex Steele and is an incredible thing. It's really, um, and, and men at arms and like Michael Cthulhu as well. I don't know if you watch yeah. that yeah. mad yes. Irish man. <laughs> <laughs> what man? He's a beast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, not, yeah. Not, insane, entirely a black, not entirely a blacksmith, but yeah. <laughs> but he's, he, but he's still fueling this idea about being able to go down to the end of the garden, pick up something made of metal and turn it into something else. And yeah, that's right. Yeah. That that's in, yeah. It, I I really think it's incredible, and it's a real shift in our idea. And uh, again, it comes back to this fringe thing. I do get. I, I think I'm diverting from your question a little bit, but um, that's all right. <laughs> you get the again. It comes back to these fringe. Um, someone someone once said to me about um, uh, like medieval reenactment. It's like there are people out there doing it, but it's so fringe. Um, the the market for blacksmithing in there is like a really tiny market um, and not everyone can do it but as YouTube's exploding obviously that market's growing and getting bigger and it's the same with blade making or axe making or hammer making um, and the thing I'm seeing that I'm getting more of is more people going can I have a hammer uh, can I have a pair of tongs and, and being able to offer people the ability to buy the stuff to make the tongs because I can I've got the equipment to process it or be able to buy the equipment uh, the tools to make the hammer or whatever it is yeah. um, and I'm trying that with the pizza cutter that I made I thought it'd be nice yeah. to give people access to the materials <coughs> without having to go and find the materials so um, uh, but no in my personal practice I'm not finding I'm getting any more interest. And I think it's because of the correlation between a, what people are willing to part with. Um, uh, you know, if, so if I put in a quote for a gate, it's not going to be less than like 600 pounds. Yeah. And that's basic. And that's really standard. That's got to cover my cost to forge a gate. I forge gates, not, weld fabricate unless I'm doing something crazy like making a, I don't know why I did that job but anyway it's not the point um, <laughs> but, we don't talk about that <laughs> but, um, or I take jobs on that I want to do and I put the price in that I want to get paid for that work whereas yeah. I don't think the majority of people are going to watch my channel and go oh wow Dan Moss makes gates I'll buy a gate off Dan I don't think that's what happens <laughs> now, because there is no value in steel steel is is, is a cheap material and there is no associated value in my time necessarily for Joe Blogs to pay yeah. uh, in excess of two thousand pound a meter for ornate scrolled up railings when they could buy it from a DIY shop around the corner, which is made in China, mm. in mass. Yep. Yeah, and, and gates are really expensive to ship overseas. So. <laughs> yeah, so it's not something. Maybe my personal the artwork that I make, the sculpture I make could sell in the future through the channel. But I don't find people yep. are very interested in watching that. Uh, and that's also con that's also um, 
something that I've come to a realization of recently that you make by making content and one of the things that I'm using the content to do is drive people to come and get interested in me and buy things that I might potentially make for them. Yeah. In order to do that, I've got to make interesting comment uh, co- content and get people like, you know, it's like throwing out a fishing net, isn't it? Um, yeah. You, you've got to, uh, you've got to try and catch as many fish as possible with that net in order to make a living. And yeah. So in answer to your question, I'm not really seeing anything other than the tool making side grow. And I'm, yeah. And it, I'm growing it because I see it. saw Alex Steele do it. And people like, um, Farum Forge, who yep, I talked to quite Farrum, a bit. Yep. He's sort of saying, they're talking about the saturation now that's happening. He's got yeah. people like me and Alec or not, not Alec anymore, but who are, who are making reasonable quality. Well, he's making amazing quality tools. I'm making reasonable yeah. quality tools. And then you've got individuals yeah, who are, <laughs> yeah. And it's just overwhelming. There's so much saturation and I don't know. I don't think it can last. No, it won't. It's going to die out eventually. There'll be a new, new craze. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, will um, come back or something. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I actually, I, I, um, you know, it was interesting for me because you know I came into blacksmithing uh, or bladesmithing as uh, as the trend started, just as man at arms was getting started up and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was when I started um, blacksmithing, so I've kind of seen that that sweep through the through the internet, and suddenly it's become this massive thing, and and you know, and you can actually see it starting to plateau now. Mm. Um, with you know, with for, with man at arms kind of dying off, and the viewership for Forge and Fire is slowly degrading, uh, and I think yeah, in the next couple of years we're going to see a lot of people start dropping off from the blacksmithing community because they're just there because it's a craze, mm. um, and you know they'll they'll jump on the next bandwagon. Uh, I think before that, uh, what was mostly most commonly seen in the craftsmanship, if you want to call it craftsmanship area area, was. Um, bushcrafting and you know that mm. kind of thing with Ray Mears and, mm-hmm. and all those guys and I was I was part of that community I still am part of that community as well but you know you're, you're seeing these kind of dips and curves in the in the um in the importance of certain uh crafts as as time goes by so it's really it's been really interesting and um you know hopefully we can we can survive the <laughs> survive the drop-off yeah I, I it's why I'm not uh, making a video a day is why I'm not or trying yeah I, I enjoy doing it and I like doing it and it's why I'm, the videos are going to change in the near future um, you have seen Ella in the video where we make the pizza she was making the dough and uh, I bet 90% of the people who watch it who came to watch me hit something hot and were just like who's the, who, uh, who's the bird with the with the bread um, <laughs> Someone's got to make the dough. <laughs> yeah, not me. <laughs> that would be awful. But Ella makes furniture, and we make furniture together. So I'm going to try to diversify and make things I want to make. And I still have customers who I see. You know, I I I, I I'm talking to customers constantly about projects. I've got projects that I'm trying to start. I've got projects that I'm starting. I've got projects that I'm working through, like the art deco job here and then i've got projects that are being finished and then these jobs are coming in and out and that's my work that's that's who i am that's my business and that's going to be my business for the rest of my life i hope yeah all being well whereas i mean yeah no yeah uh, yeah, it's all good i was just um thinking uh it's similar to the conversation we have with roy um uh, i think you've listened to a few of our episodes yeah. Um. Not sure if you listened to the one where we interviewed Roy. Yeah, I did. But, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, the the whole idea of of making what you want to make and charging what you need to charge in order to do what you love, uh, and not too worrying too much about what the uh the, what the people on on the internet say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. And I like Roy's views on it. It's very optimistic. Um. <laughs> you still need to have a customer at the end of the day. And one of the things that the degree course is about, and I'm, I'm promoting the degree course because I really believe in it. Um, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that it does is it gives you the ability to interact with customers, to develop a relationship where you can go, 
Oh, it's, some people take this away. Some people make bowls. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you, you can sit down with the customer and say, I'm Dan, this is what I do. This, what are you looking for? And they show you, and then you tell them what they want and <laughs> then try and extract money from that person. And that's, that's the, the blunt way of putting it. That's, the, that's my day-to-day living. And people come to me like Cardiff Museum. They came to me because they know my reputation, that I can get the job done and give them a product. It's slightly different. It's not gates and railings or whatever, or sculpture or hammers, but it's the same context. That's what's going to, my career is only, as long as I keep doing a good job, my career as a blacksmith is relatively safe as long as I don't make a big mistake or <laughs> along the way. But this YouTube thing is a sort of a, a subsidiary. It's an addition. It would be amazing to be, you know, think how much money Alex Steele's making off ad revenue and advertising VPN and the selling that blade that he's just made that. Uh, Cavaliers Cavalry sword Saber. sold Cavalry. it for 19, yeah. 19 and a half thousand US I think mm. I, I, uh, I don't think he got paid for all the hours he put in but then the YouTube no, makes up no. for that and it's like it. if one person buys a hammer and I've made a video where I made the hammer my ad revenue is going up and I'm earning more money through YouTube but the ultimate goal is that that hammer has then paid for the time to make the video plus the video revenue. So yeah, it's been, it's beneficial and it's great and it's really nice to have it. Um, and, but it's not the end goal. It's, it never was. And it's just a little bit of fun. And it's, and I, the other thing about it that I really enjoy is the community and meeting yeah, people absolutely. like you guys and having conversations. Like I, the conversation about the tongs, he said, some guy said, um, are they left-handed or right-handed tongs? And I said, oh, I centre the bar, the reins on my tongs so anyone can use them. But for me personally, when I'm forging, the tongs are in my left hand. But when I'm on the power hammer, they're in my right hand. So I have to have tongs that I can use in both hands. So having a, a indexed set of tongs isn't, isn't suitable for my practice. Yeah. Um, and he's like, thanks for that information. You know, I watched John and he gave me this information and you've given me this information. And it's exciting because... And that's those sort of relationships are really nice to have and be able to sort of develop and and then meeting Roy, not meeting Roy, but you know having those conversations with Roy and going to the states yep. and I don't know if you guys know uh, Twan at Warped Legacy, we set up our channels the same day basically and we've been making videos just consistent and we've been well I consider Twan to be a good mate so uh, yeah that's that's what YouTube does. That's what the internet does. It gives me some sales, but ultimately it allows me to do something that I enjoy and, um, and, share and, like and, and share with people. Yeah. Yeah. And right, I mean, that's yeah. something that we always touch on with, um, with our guests is that the community is one of the biggest things we take away from our time in the limelight. Um, you know, Alex has, you know, a dedicated quite, quite a bit of his uh, energy to helping substantiate the, uh, you know, give some substance to the community with the Mank Tank Challenge, uh, mm. which I, I loved your video, by the way. <laughs> Dan, that was great. <laughs> oh, it made my week when I saw that Dan had done the Mank Tank Challenge. It was bloody brilliant. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, but right. but um, my, my, my model with, um, with what I make and what I, how I choose to make it is, is always I, I make things that people will want. It's not, it's not uh, looking what's trending and what people are after and making those things. I just try and make things that when people see them, they go, oh, wow, I don't really want to have that. If you make enough of them, then you start getting the sales come through. But I'm, I'm a big tech nerd and I like to look into where all of the different attention streams come from in my work. And I've been amazed that about half of the traffic that I get to my Etsy page comes from direct linking off of my YouTube videos. And I've only been running the channel now for about three months. Um, so the, the YouTube community is definitely, uh, it's, it's got value in it, even if you're not at the point. I mean, Sam's just recently gotten monetized. Um, Dan has gone from, I was just saying to him off, off air before, that in two years' time, he's gone from having hitting 500 subs now having 10,000 subs uh, and getting in that many people's living rooms to um, have them look, watching you do your work. It's, it's, it's great exposure um, regardless of what you're doing and especially if you choose to take the route like people like Dan or Roy or John who take the time to actually make educational content and not just show 
it's it's not necessarily just showing people how to do something it's showing prospective customers how something was done mm. and yeah like Dan mentioned before, sometimes you tell people what the price of something is and they balk and think there's no possible way it's worth that much money. But all they have to do is watch a video of the process that it takes to go through it and they understand. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to buy, but they understand. And if you start getting a reputation, um, whether it's for the quality of your work or for the content that you put out on YouTube or both or, or other things, it, it, it really helps that understanding and it makes people much more willing to spend the money to get something that you have made and made by hand. Yeah, it helps. Um, you know, like like we've said in previous episodes, um, the it helps sell the story. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons that Alex Steele actually sold that um, Viking sword for as much as he did, and the saber is not so much that he was selling a hyper valuable sword. Like, I mean, that sword was, uh, you know, a very beautiful. Both swords were very beautiful, and they did have some, you know gold and gems and all that kind of stuff in them but the the actual um you know kind of altogether the the materials he used were negligibly um expensive uh compared to you know nineteen and a half thousand dollars but the story of that blade being built the you know the fact that he was selling the the you know the build itself I think is a really important thing as well. And I think that's something that um you'll probably get as well Dan in in the future if you start uh if you keep making tooling and stuff like that, as people will be willing to pay whatever they can to get a Dan Moss hammer, um, <laughs> <laughs> purely yeah, because it comes from you, and they get to see it, see it made, I'm, and they I'm, know I'm who working you are. on it personally. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I want yeah. one since I crack my hammers, as it seems. <laughs> yeah. I had a student do that. I had a student pop one in half. He didn't break in half half when he was using it, but it cracked when he heat treated it, and that's we like, let's split that in half. So. <laughs> So, yeah. So, yeah, my aim, guy, I've got a I've got a list of people I want a uh, hammer and, and tongs from and, and Dan's on that list, so it's it's gonna happen eventually. Cool. Cool. So, Mates rates. I've got my um <laughs> I've got my Sam Towns hammer and tongs. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, right, just right. one last thing is that the anvil build is going to be done by hand with a group of people to demonstrate the small billets can be put together. Okay, there's the end, there's a heat treating at the end, and I there's complications with that that I'm struggling with. But the 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 idea is to give an example of how an individual in their forge with a group of friends can they can start making their own anvils. Okay, it's gonna cost you you're gonna to have to buy the stock and you're gonna to have to get your mates together and you've got to fill them with beer and, and biscuits <laughs> and and yeah. you've got to you've got to have that you've got to you've got to get past that but once you get past that monetary thing and that you think i can do this because it is it is all about giving it a go and getting in the forge and practicing and like you know john switzer says you know put your safety glasses on and most of all get into the forge and that's yeah. that's it at the end of the day you can watch as many videos as you want you can have as many conversations as you like i hate this saying i hate it Less yak yak, more whack whack. Because um, <laughs> you do sometimes need to do the yak yak, but you do still need to get in there. And being able to share that with people and say, if you go to the Etsy, you can buy the stock, you can make your own pizza cutter. Or you can yeah. buy a hammer blank and make your own hammer. Um, or you can buy the tools to make the hammers. Or you can come for a class and make the hammers. I think that's what it's... Yeah, that's one of the things that YouTube is doing as well. So that's and that's what I would like to achieve: the idea that it's doable. And if you follow along, and you might not follow everything, you might just pick up one tip. But at least you got that one tip. So yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, we hit our mark five minutes ago. <laughs> so um, Daniel, if people want to find you, where can they find you? Um, obviously, on my YouTube channel. Um, uh, which is search for Daniel Moss blacksmith or uh, trust me I'm a blacksmith I thought I changed it to trust me I'm a blacksmith but it doesn't work I don't think ever, all the time but just Daniel Moss uh, on YouTube Instagram is uh, IA Studios underscore Dan and um, the Etsy is Mosco Craft which is Etsy uh, www.etsy.com forward slash UK forward slash shop forward slash Moss M-O-S-S and then co co craft and look for the icon of the googly-eyed power hammer. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one. 
All right. So if you want to ask us a question or suggest anything for the podcast in the future, you can send us an email at ask.forgecast or you can find us on Instagram at the.forgecast. And you can find me at uh, Instagram and YouTube and uh, stuff like that. Or at uh, You just search for Nils Ögren or Ogren, depending on your place in the world. And where can you find Sam? You can find me at Samtown's Bladesmith on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And I would just like to say um, the um, Forgecast email is ask.forgecast at gmail.com. What did I say? Um, you just you just said uh, ask.forgecast. Um, oh. <laughs> so just, just to clarify, it is on Gmail. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you want to get me anywhere to get to it. Where can we find Alex? And you can find me on YouTube under Valhalla Ironworks and also there under the same name on Instagram and Facebook and the same on Etsy as well. Um, just search for Valhalla Ironworks and you'll find me. All right. So uh, thank you so much for everyone who listened and thank you so much for, uh, to Daniel for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. It's been awesome, Dan. All right. Goodbye, everyone, and have a great week wherever you are. Bye. See you guys. See ya.